Guys, we made it. We're, we're at the finish line. It's been an amazing, amazing summit. Memorable, uh, for sure. Historic for our organization. And it's going to end on that note. Um, I want to thank everyone for being here. We're, we have a, such a treat for this last plenary. Uh, a few housekeeping things and also just a reminder of where we've just been. I just want to remind you that we started on Monday with professional learning communities and Kelly Leonard from Second City in our partnership parade. And then we had an education town hall with some of the top national education experts in America. And then yesterday we had Clint Smith and Rahima Ellis. And if you want one of Clint Smith's books, uh, we still have a few signed copies left in our lounge. And to promote, like Broderick, if you get a sweatshirt and a book together, it's a discount for you. So you can uh, see, see what you want to do. We want to take less boxes home. Oh, oh now our model. Oh, the, Broderick's too good looking. That's the problem. That's the problem. And then, and then we had Secretary of Education Cardona come for lunch for the third year in a row. And as he said, I don't do anything for three years in a row. But he comes to the Summer Learning Association Conference. And then last night, we had a special, memorable, meaningful evening at the African American Museum of History and Culture. Uh, and we had just so many special memories made there. So thank you for that. And now here we are. And we're talking about how can we take everything we've learned and take it forward, take it back to our communities, our programs, and, and make a huge impact on kids. And I just want to, on your seats, there are two amazing resources that NSLA has been working on uh, for a long time, and we're excited to, to share with you with our partners, Professor Gil Noam and his team at ISRI and uh, Pear at Harvard. One is we've had our Summer Starts in September guidebook. It's been a great book. It's been very helpful for a lot of people, but we've had it for many years, and we are updating it to make it more relevant for 2023. And he and his team and our team have been working together. It's called Destination Summer Learning. If you want to get a free order, a copy of that book, again, go to the NSLA Lounge. That's coming out, comes with real training, and it's going to be amazing and, and, and relevant for our times. Also, because you are so busy working with kids, you might not have time to read all the research reports that are coming out about the impact of summer learning, especially in the years after COVID. So, NSLA and Harvard and Gil Noam's team did that for you. And we have an executive summary that looked at 100 different reports. And here are the major themes that you need to know about. So I hope you take a look at that. And then after our panel, <clears throat> we are going to have our final book signing, Daryl McDaniels, who's here, uh, you know, DMC. We're very excited, honored that he'll be here. He's written two books. And he'll be signing them. We have his book, More for Grownups, and we have his children's book, Daryl's Dream. You can pick up either one of them uh, at our bookstore and then go to the mezzanine for signing. So I just want you to know, put that into your agenda. But now we're going to get into what we're talking about, how to support the whole child, the whole year, and we're going to have a, a big, deep focus, and you're going to hear a lot about how do we support the mental health challenges facing our kids, and what can we do as leaders and educators to support them. Fantastic, fantastic. So, you know, we've been talking about partnerships and the power of partnerships throughout, you know, theme throughout this experience. We cannot do this by ourselves. Uh, you know, as the brother said again, I think on the first day, reminded us that, you know, we can go fast by ourselves, but we can certainly go farther together. And so uh, with that, I'd like to invite uh, Brother John McPhee to the stage. Show us that power of partnership for sure. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Thank you, Broderick. Thank you, Aaron, and the National Summer Learning Association for your focus on youth well-being. I'm John McPhee, the CEO of the Jed Foundation, and we are a nonprofit that works with schools and youth serving organizations to help them foster and build cultures of caring where young people can thrive and where risks for suicide are reduced. In late uh, 2021, the US Surgeon General, Dr. Vivek Murthy, issued an advisory about worsening youth mental health in America, and he called for an all of society response. And an all of society response is exactly what young people need. They've experienced substantial grief and loss due to COVID. The physical isolation and the prolonged nature of the physical isolation was a serious insult to their development, to their social emotional development. And they're anxious, they're upset, they're even angry about climate change, 
racism and inequities, school and mass shootings, war, incivility, economic pressures, attacks on their LGBTQ peers, attacks on the telling of their own history. Their developing brains are outmatched by the algorithms designed to consume their attention. They feel disconnected. 36% of teenagers feel they have no purpose. And they're questioning the adults around them. They're questioning the institutions around them. And yet, it's not all bad news. <laughs> that felt very grim, but that, was, but that is what it is, and we need to, we need to say it. Um, they're remarkable, young people. They're remarkable, and they're resilient, and they're no snowflakes. They're dealing with a lot. They want to make the world better. They want to help their friends. They want fairness, compassion, and equity, and they want the truth to be told. All of this is happening while they're at the age of expression where most major mental illness first shows itself. And so what can we do? Well, there's a lot of ways that we, and when I say we, I'm talking about older adults, I'm talking about the adults and the organizations that surround young people. Um, there's a lot we can do because there's a lot we know. Life skill development helps young people better navigate challenges, right? And there's a lot of challenges. Uh, so problem solving, social emotional skill development, very, very important for their well-being. Feelings of connectedness, uh, connectedness to each other, connectedness to institutions, connectedness to older adults, um, belonging, a sense of belonging, incredibly protective. One of the most important actual dimensions, the extent to which somebody feels isolated and they don't belong as compared to the extent where they feel they do belong. This is very protective. Supportive relationships with adults, caring adults who provide validation, acknowledge what's going on and what they feel, and just provide a sense of presence and, and solidity and stability, very protective. Um, modeling for youth that it's okay not to be okay, right? If we model that, then it tells youth uh, that it's okay and that can strengthen help giving and help seeking behaviors, right? It begins with how we, how we approach and model that. And then the places that young people spend time, so schools, um, community-based organizations, right? Uh, what we call boundaried communities can all have a plan, a purposeful plan uh, to ensure that these are safe and affirming communities. And I cannot think of a field that has more promise to support the well-being of young people than summer learning in camps. You provide opportunities for millions of young people to develop life skills, to find connectedness and a sense of belonging, to build relationships, to explore purpose, new hobbies, new activities, to get outside, to be active. All of this is incredibly protective for mental health. And on top of this great foundation that you have, you have the opportunity, and you're doing it, as evidenced by here and by Campwell, to make mental health and well-being a planned priority in your work in which you help build these protective factors and help establish systems that can identify and notice a young person if they're struggling so that we can get them the care that they need. Your work is already so supportive of youth mental health. I'm excited by and grateful for, and on behalf of the entire mental health field and youth mental health field, want to thank you for supporting the healthy development of millions of young people. Thank you. Thank you so much, John, for your leadership and partnership in the Jed Foundation. Such a critical, important work. We appreciate you being here and look forward to working with you. I'm now going to call up uh, a, a wonderful uh, National Summer Learning Association board member, Dr. Rachel Thornton. She's Vice President, Chief Equity Officer at Nemours Children's Health, practicing primary uh, care pediatrician, nationally recognized innovator in health equity research and practice. She also served on the National Academy of Sciences uh, Commission on Shaping Summertime Experiences, and she's a great mom as well. Let's welcome her, Dr. Rachel Thornton. Well, thank you, Erin, for that warm introduction and for including mention of my most important job as a mother. Um, I'm also a pediatrician and really dedicated to the health and well-being of our children. 
and everywhere uh, that supports them, every group that supports them. So I would just wanna thank all of you for what you are doing across our nation in the interest of supporting children during a time of year where we have to build different systems and we have to come together in different ways during the summer to make sure that they're safe, healthy, and thriving. Um, as was already mentioned, um, there is a mental health crisis in America. There was a Kaiser Family Foundation CNN Mental Health in America survey last year that found that 90% of people believed that our country is amid a mental health crisis. 45% of parents surveyed um, were concerned about the long-term mental health effects of COVID on youth development and mental health challenges. And 80% uh, of parents were concerned about depression, anxiety, and substance use disorder and alcohol on our, on our teenagers. But we know from the Surgeon General's advisory in 2021 that these are not new challenges for our young people. We've been facing a mounting crisis with one in five children, even before the pandemic, ages three to 17, affected by a mental health challenge. And as someone working in healthcare delivery, important to note that at that time, of the 7.7 .7 million estimated children affected by a mental health challenge, half of them, that's 3.9 million children, didn't have access to the kinds of treatment they needed, effective treatment to support them. But there is a path forward, and it's a path, again, that involves all of us and a whole of society approach. It's a path forward that the continuing work and commitment of the Surgeon General's office brings forth um, in their continued focus on our youth. Nemours Children's Health shares the Surgeon General's office's view uh, that it takes a whole of society approach, including education, community, child care settings, and so many others during the summer and all year round. Uh, and that is why we created our Whole Child Health Alliance, focused on working alongside amazing partners uh, to, uh, to really address the important needs of our youth in every environment. We understand the inextricable link between physical and mental health and are committed to doing our part to improve that access to effective mental health services. For, more, for 20 years, our organization, Nemours Children's Health, has been a leader in embedding behavioral health in primary care and training providers who today are practicing at hospitals around the country. And we need collaboration that involves all of us across government, across many different sectors, healthcare, the private sector, community organizations, nonprofits, working with like-minded partners, in our, including everyone in this room today, to support our ability to create the healthiest generations of children in the future. And together we know that we can go beyond medicine, beyond what happens inside healthcare, to bring these nurturing, health-promoting, loving environments for children to every aspect of their life. So I, I wanna thank all of you. And now I have the distinct honor and pleasure to introduce the Deputy Surgeon General, uh, Admiral Denise Hinton. She is an amazing public servant with a distinguished career, uh, a background as a nurse. Uh, she is someone who has served our nation in the US Air Force and as a decorated manager and scientific leader in the US Public Health Service. She previously served as chief scientist at the US Food and Drug Administration. And in her current role, she advises and supports the United States Public Health Service and advises and supports the Surgeon General regarding operations of the Public Health Service, and also advises and supports on communication uh, of the best scientific evidence to our nation. Um, I just wanna thank her again for her service and invite her to come forward and talk to us further this morning. Thank you so much for being here, Admiral. I would like to say good morning, everyone, and it's my honor and pleasure and privilege to be here with all of you. 
I do want to say we do have some, um, you know, I do have some prepared r remarks today, but I am just glad um, to be with you today and truly want to thank the CEO, um, Aaron Twerkin and Dr. Thornton um, for that introduction. And I want to congratulate all of you just on a wonderful night of celebration that you had last night um, at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And I also want to thank you all to hear, that are here today, um, just educators, mentors, and youth development leaders, for you are our leaders of today and tomorrow, and you're certainly doing the hard work of developing our leaders of today and tomorrow, so thank you. <laughs> I also just want to, again, just state the importance of all of you being here, and then um, for me, being able to be here with you. It was unplanned, but I, I, I certainly appreciate the opportunity. And just want to thank you for all that you do to prioritize and to truly address um, the issues facing young people today and critically working every day to break down the opportunity gaps to, that two million children today still face. And I do know that Dr. Murthy, our U.S. Surgeon General, is sorry that he wasn't able to be with you today, but I'm grateful to be able to take part in today's summit and to see the wonderful work that this group is accomplishing. I did have the opportunity um, in the breakout room just to be able to, uh, to speak to a number of our leaders, and I'm learning more about what you're doing to contribute to um, our community, our society, and our youth. So I, I, I truly applaud your efforts. I do want to say that in particular, um, as a woman of color serving in government um, and in this role, it's especially meaningful for me to just know that there is so much work being done uh, in communities across the country to support the educational, emotional, social, and mental well-being for young people who need it the most. Um, in my career path, and it has taken me through some surprising pathways, um, and then prior to my serving as the Deputy Surgeon General, as Dr. Thornton um, has stated, I served as the Chief Scientist at the FDA and as an Air Force Nurse Officer. I earned my degree in the STEM field. I would say that it was not, uh, it, it, not an easy journey at all, but I think as um, a mother of two, and both of my children are also um, in, uh, have um, STEM degrees, um, as it was important for me for them to have that. So I can't say they, they chose it. I may have chosen it for them. <laughs> but in that, I just say as a foundation, you know, I think um, the STEM education as a whole really does lay the foundation for you know, all of us to make evidence-based um, decisions that inform what we do across our nation, but also across our globe. And it also sets the foundation for, for kids to really think um, analytically, right? And, and to be able to not just accept what's in front of them, but to think about it, you know, research it, um, and even challenge it a little bit and challenge them themselves to learn more about it and to incorporate it into their education to their lives and then to the communities in which we are all here to serve. I would just say that um, my pathway, uh, I, you know, I, I you know, uh, wasn't one that was chosen. I always say that my steps are ordered, and they certainly were in a way that I couldn't account for or plan for. Um, I'm a believer, so I would say the good Lord put some fabulous people in my life, um, including my wonderful mom and dad. Um, and many of my family members and folks in my community. My dad was a uh, um, graduate, um, but also um, he was an a, a enlisted person that um, served in the United States Air Force for 26 years. So I had the opportunity to travel the world. I had the opportunity to experience different cultures, meet different people, um, but really um, had the chance to to meet uh, m many people, um, have many cultural experiences um, in a way that I, I recognize um, some don't, um, but like to share those efforts um, with people and also li like to share with our youth the importance of um, getting to know the people within and outside of your community, getting to know and experience the different cultures um, and being and building upon uh, the community and what you learn um, is important. Um, I also recognize that it is important in, um, in recognizing that you need, you can only aspire to be what you see. So you also need 
from your different communities to see people that look like you and have come to accomplish and succeed in many ways. And for you to see that, to know about that, have access, exposure, um, um, is incredibly important in shaping the paths. It was certainly important in shaping my path. So all of you have that critically important role um, through education, but also in supporting our youth of today and tomorrow as far as their their social well-being, um, their sense of community, their connection, and for the key importance in focusing on their mental health and well-being. I would say I had that throughout the course of my career, um, and then also out, out, outside of the foundation and building up to, to what I've been able to accomplish um, here today. Um, and I, I do want to say that I, I, I do hold close to my heart the, the, the different pathways as a young person can gain from the foundation early in life that allows them to succeed. I would say in whatever, they, whatever way they define success, um, down the line, later in their lives, um, we are just you know, coming off the, the, the heels of a, a World Mental Health Summit Day, and I'm grateful that today, as part of that summit, um, you're focusing specifically on youth mental health. Um, as you have known and was just stated that the Surgeon General issued a Surgeon General's advisory on youth mental health, um, and these advisories are often issued to call the public's attention to an urgent health matter. And as you all know, coming out of COVID, um, on top of the decade of troubling trends, youth mental health was in, undeniably in a state of crisis, and we are in a state of crisis, so your attention to this topic is incredibly important. In fact, Dr. Murthy issued the advisory after years of traveling across the country and hearing directly from young people about the struggles that they and their peers face, um, from the daily pressures of school to the way social media made them feel bad about themselves. In the advisory, um, he said that one of our biggest obstacles and maybe the most important urgent action as we as a country need to take was overcoming stigma. In the meaning, you know, making sure that everyone knows that their mental health is important, that mental health challenges are normal, and that it's not only okay, but an act of strength to ask for help. Now, just nearly two years later, and thanks to a large part to the work done by all of you, um, we've never been more confident that the stigma is being broken. Because now when we travel across the country and talk to people or read the newspaper or go on the social media or watch TV or talk to friends and other doctors, we can see an increasingly um, widespread recognition um, of the importance of mental health as part of the overall health. Um, more people are often now talking about their struggles, their recoveries, and their needs. And President Biden um, includes mental health priorities in his unity agenda, and it talks about it in speeches, and then this was also rolled out, the 988 hotline, which has been an inc um, incredibly um, um, important addition, I think, to the platform, and is in great use. So I would say in recognizing the critical role that the summer learning programs have in solving this crisis, this administra administration has invested a historic $30 billion in federal funding for summer learning specifically. I see state and local policymakers taking their own important steps to make progress as well. I see leaders like all of you um, just stepping up and making the programmatic commitments that communities need to thrive. And most importantly, I see young people sharing their own stories, being support systems for their friends and their classmates, and changing the narrative that tells them that their mental health is something they should not be embarrassed or ashamed of. It's incredibly important for folks to be able to, to like, share their feelings, but also support others in sharing theirs and helping them to get through the rough and tough times. We have to do that as a community. But I would just say, just to be sure, um, there is absolutely more work to be done to end this crisis. The next generation of prevention and treatment, we have too many kids you know, still hurting, still lacking the resources they need to get help, still feeling alone. Um, that's what today is all about. All your, your events over the course of the week, that's what it's about. We can work together to create safe, supportive, and affirming environments that support the well-being of young people. But I don't want to lose sight of the progress we've made together on that first critical step. 
and I would say serving as the Deputy Surgeon General, and I know I speak for Dr. Murthy and a lot of people when I say thank you. I speak for a lot of people when I can say that you give me hope, you give us hope. And I hope that kids can grow up in a world where they don't feel ashamed if they're hurting, confused, or isolated. A world that, um, where they are comfortable asking for help when they need it and where they, the help is readily accessible to them. In a world where they, their friends, and their peers are all anchored to the values of love, kindness, and respect. That is what I wish for them, and that's what I wish for all of you. That is what I wish for our nation as a whole. And I'm so grateful for all the work that you are doing and that you will continue to do today and every day, and just to make that world a reality for all. So with that, I just want to thank you again for your time and for your commitment to our youth and for our nation. And I hope you continue to enjoy all the events and the activities for the rest of the week. Thank you. Thank you, Rear Admiral Hinton. Please send our best to the Surgeon General. We look forward to working with both of you and welcoming you back in, in future uh, events. Again, a great honor to have you. Um, we are really excited. We are now at our last panel, last session of this entire conference, this historic summit in 2023 for NSLA. And just a quick point before I bring up our moderator, we've talked about, and one of the things that makes this conference and summit so special is that we have leaders, you hear it all the time, we have leaders from government, we have leaders from nonprofit, we have leaders from the private sector. And the reason you have them all together is because good ideas can come from any one of those sectors. But sustainable good ideas and sustained solutions will only come when all those sectors work together. Our next moderator, Fatima Shama not only is on the NSLA National Board, of, so we are so grateful for your service and leadership to us, but she models this. She has worked in the government sector as the Commissioner of Immigrant Affairs for the City of New York. She has worked in the nonprofit sector as the CEO of the Fresh Air Fund, a national award-winning summer learning program. And now she works in the private sector as the chief DEI officer for Bloomberg LP, supporting and there are hundreds of thousands of, of employees all around uh, the world even. So she understands bringing people together, a multi-sector perspective, and she understands the issues we're working on. And I want to welcome Fatima to help moderate this next session. Thank you. I know that I stand between you and possibly you going home. Um, that's a hard task, but I promise you that this final panel um, will deliver. And so thank you um, for being here. Um, what an honor to hear Dr. Thornton and Rear Admiral um, Hinton speak. Aaron, thank you. I do, I do want to take a minute, um, if, I, if you will indulge me. We're talking about children. We're talking about young people and we're talking about them in our country. But as we all know, we live in a global world and the world is complicated right now. It is painfully heartbreaking, horrifically complicated. And so I need us to take a second or 10 to just center that innocent children and young people and people are being devastated in circumstances they have never asked for. And so if I could ask you for a minute we can't, we may not have a minute, um, but I, if I could ask you to breathe for 10 seconds, sending positive energy for love and peace and children and their well being in the state of trauma and horror that we are witnessing in this world today. Thank you for letting me pause for a minute. So, I will admit it has been a little guilty being in this microcosm. I'll just say that. So thank you for all that you do um, and all that I know we can do. 
Now, I want to invite up this incredible panel um, that I am going to be honored to have a conversation with. So to start, um, Dr. Aliyah Samuel, um, who is the president and CEO of CASEL, the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning. Um, <laughs> Dr. Samuel, uh, in addition, is a senior fellow at Harvard University at the Center uh, on the Developing Child. She's a bilingual executive editor with expertise from early childhood through higher education. She previously served uh, as a deputy assistant secretary of local, state, and national engagement at the US Department of Education. She has informed state policy agendas. She's assisted with cross, uh, developing cross-systems approaches to policy and supporting children and families, leading systems level change, and I am so thrilled to be in dialogue with you. Um, Arda Stevens, who is the CEO of Big Brothers Big Sisters of America. As the president and CEO of Big Brothers and Big Sisters of America, Artis has taken the helm of this organization at an incredibly important time um, in, our, in our country and quite frankly for our nation's youth. Um, he grew up the youngest in a large family with modest resources. He is the son and grandson of preachers and he often shares, rather than going into ministry, his calling for the past 25 years has focused on youth development and empowering young people. I wanna just add, he is the first black CEO at Big Brothers Big Sisters of America in its 100 plus history. <clears throat> and I know he recognizes, as he says, um, the many leaders who blazed the trail before him, but as he so rightly says, um, it provides fuel for the more barriers to be broken. And so, amen to that. And without any um, hesitation, um, I am really excited to invite a fellow New Yorker, born and raised, um, Daryl McDaniels up to join in this conversation, who for the past 25 years, who needs no introduction, might I add. Uh, Jam Master Jay, uh, um, Daryl has um, for the past 25 years been a leader. He's a co-founder of um, Camp Felix, who was honored um, last night brilliantly. Uh, um, he's had an influence on popular culture. He's a pioneer in hip hop. Um, he's the first rap artist to grace the cover of Rolling Stones magazine. He has changed music, quite frankly. I think your, cre your courage, your creativity, um, and your commitment is just extraordinary. And once again, just incredible. So let's have a conversation. Okay, is this on? Yes, great. Mm -hmm. So we heard from Dr. Thornton and um, Rear Admiral Hinton, and I wanna start there. So Dr. Samuels, can we start there? When you hear the conversation um, with some incredibly, um, and Joe, your, your stats as well, um, of, of what our young people are experiencing, um, why, why do we need to have this conversation? So first and foremost, I appreciate you bringing our young people from around the world. Um, CASEL is a nonprofit and we are primarily a pre-K through 12 US based company. But the expansion of global interest around social emotional learning and well-being has been enormous. And just last year, my first year in this role, we had over 101 requests internationally for support. This year, our conference is in November. We have 33 countries that are now registered to attend. Because this is not just a US issue, it is a global issue and global priority. And what we're hearing, I mean, the statistics are alarming. We heard from the Surgeon General, can you imagine 36% of our kids feel like they have no purpose? I, but that alone is starking. And then when we talk about school environments, we still have 22 to 23 percent of our nation's kids absent from school. Why? They're not connected. So all the data is telling us the story that to pay attention to our young people. They are telling us whether it is depression and anxiety rates, whether it's chronic absenteeism, whether it's the lack of academic recovery, and I can go on, that if we don't address these challenges, we are, this is a 
bi-generational issue. Like it's not, it's a two-gen issue. It's not just impacting the current generation, but their kids and grandkids. So if that's not enough to sound the alarm, and in a very real way, I'm not sure what else is. Our young people are legit talking to us, and we should be answering their call, not ours. Mm. Um, Derek, yeah. We heard um, the, the, the statement in all society response, right? It's a powerful statement. Daryl, um, you've spent your career largely in the spotlight, um, and you have sold over 40 million albums, you changed music history, and you now have put, you are spending your energy and time and your voice um, in a different way, and to me it feels like you are lifting an all society response. Why? Well, um, what people tend to forget, <clears throat> hip hop was created by um, individuals, young people. Typical rapper was 12 to like 21 years old. And it was created by people who were living in a traumatic experience. So the world perceived that they had nothing because they wasn't getting no assistance. Nobody was helping them. So they looked inside of themselves and they pulled out the art, they pulled out the style, they pulled out the fashion, they pulled out the music. But the reason why I do what I do is because hip hop isn't about show business or entertainment. It's about responsibility. It gives you the power and the position to address the issues that you um, are struggling with and then with that, you sit down and you look at what is the solution. So y'all remember the message. The message was a mental health record. It's like a jungle sometimes. Don't push me. Everybody was going through it. Right after the message came a record by um, the Soul Sonic Force called Planet Rock. We know a place where it's all good where everybody's eating, where there's no fighting, where there's no stress and struggle, but we realized that we had to work for it. So I was put in this position by this great culture of hip hop to represent the people that don't, or the people that are not being seen or heard. We read about these conditions, we read about the um, situations in all communities, like you said, globally, but nobody is talking about what the actual people are going through. One of the things that I like about hip hop, hip hop says, yo, you must keep it real. So I do this because I want to move, remove the guilt and the shame to reduce the pain so that we can destroy and annihilate the stigma so these young people know that it's cool to talk about what you're going through. It's cool to ask for help. Everybody's going through something, but a lot of people are afraid, ashamed to admit it. Yeah. So I'm just trying to be an example of what really is powerful to overcome all of the stuff that we are going through. I'm an example of that. And an incredible one at that. artists. We heard and know, this room knows, the power of caring adults, supportive relationships, the feeling of the feeling, an important feeling of belonging. Um, big Brothers and Big Sisters has presence across this country that creates that very special place. Just on this note of what young people are going through, can we talk a little bit about the work you're seeing the work you're leading, the work that Big Brothers and Big Sisters is doing in communities, creating that trust. Talk, talk to us about Yeah, absolutely. Underway. First and foremost, just thank you for having me here. And it's such an honor and a pleasure to be on this esteemed panel. Um, here's where I'll start with this. And, and just listening to some of the comments that were shared uh, earlier, you know, the idea of loneliness, isolation, um, mental health, it's not an individual issue, right? This is connected to us all. This is part of the community of who we are as human beings. And when I think about 
big brothers and big sisters and in our journey and our story in this, you know, there are two things that I think about. One is much more organizationally, one is much more personal, and it's, and it's a message for everyone sitting in this room and watching. You know, it's this idea of redesign and, and redefine, right? The idea of redesigning is that we have to think about how we re redesign our solutions for young people to meet them where they are, right? For so long in our country, and our, it's, it's been this structure about, hey, come to us or this is the system, or this is the process, versus this is what you really need and how we cater to that. If you think about our organization, we've been around 119 years. You said, you said it earlier. We were founded, and a lot of people don't know this, as an alternative innovation to the juvenile justice system in New York City, because kids were going through the court system, and they said they, there has to be a more innovative way of solving this issue. And that's why Big Brothers Big Sisters was created as an alternative to justice, to create more equity in kids' lives, to bring together diverse communities so that every kid feels included for opportunity, a better life, and connectedness, justice, equity, diversity, inclusion. That's why we call ourselves a Jedi-focused youth empowerment organization. Mm -hmm. When you think 119 years moving forward, we were doing one-to-one -one mentoring, and we've been one of the best at doing one-to-one -one mentoring, and we're going to continue to do that work. But it also said, are we meeting young people where they are? Do we have to redefine the type of organization that we're being to truly meet them? So we said we have to redefine and become a one-to-one -one plus organization, meaning that we're going to continue to do one-to-one, -one, but we also have to think about a lot of kids and a lot of mentors may want to do other things to come into this community. If we're going to attract kids who are coming through and who are experiencing some of the most challenges in their lives, marginalized, BIPOC youth, LGBTQ plus community, rural youth, we got to create the types of outcomes, the plus outcomes, plus experiences, and plus people that creates ecosystems and communities around their lives. So that was the part of re re redesigning. And then one last thing I want to say is the redefining. And this is a message because we're talking about young people. But we can't have this conversation about talking about young people without talking about the people that are serving young people. Staff, volunteers, teachers, coaches. Because if you're feeling it, what do you think kids are going to feel when they're going through the experience? So, so I'll tell you this. In my own personal journey, I started this organization, the first black CEO, my first week on the job, in a very vulnerable moment, my first week on the job, I was, it was the highest moment of my career, right? The highest moment. The end of that week, my dad passed away suddenly. In my community where I grew up, it was this idea of when you were a man, and particularly being a black man, there were certain things you didn't share, and you, you were not vulnerable enough to sort of say, hey, I'm hurting, and I'm going through. Six months from that standpoint, six months to the day that my dad died, my brother passed away suddenly. A year to the point that my dad died, my board member, I think some of you may remember the name, Chesley Chris, Miss America, passed away through suicide. She was on my board, one of my best friends and anchors, three deaths. And here I am leading an organization that's talking about mentorship and mental health and support. And there were things struggling that I was going through. But I had to be the person that would accept and be vulnerable to say, I have to be able to admit it, to acknowledge it, to open up and assess so that I can be the best person to help others in space. Because if I'm not putting on the air so I can breathe first, how am I going to be able to affect it to be able to help others? That's part of the charge that we have to have in our community as well. Wow. Broderick says often, um, gems. Um, that was, that was gems. Um, I also just want to say um, the power and importance as we talk about our young people is actually what you just shared, which is to care for our children, we have to care for ourselves. Um, the oxygen mask is real. If we don't put it on first, um, so leaders in this room, Remember to care for your people, because your people care for our people, right? It's very powerful. Um, in the 10 years leading up to the pandemic, just picking up on that, the feelings of sadness and hopelessness, as well as suicidal thoughts um, and behaviors, increased 
by over 40% in our young people. That was before the pandemic. Um, so you just brought that to life. Um, that's a CDC um, reality. Dr. Samuel, as we think about coming out of the pandemic, this reality of sadness, hopelessness, the 30% feel they have no purpose, right? Teens telling us. Um, there's a dialogue about academic recovery. Um, there is a conversation about absenteeism. Uh, and in some way, these feelings of hopelessness and anxiety and disengagement are deeply connected to that social and, and emotional reality. Can you, can you talk about um, what do we need to know? What do we need to do? Um, how should we be recognizing it, supporting it? So first I'll say, I'm gonna quote an educator. One of the beauties, it's a blessing and a burden of this role, role is I spend a lot of time in the field and I actually have always done that. In my last role as Deputy Assistant Secretary, I was in Charlotte, North Carolina, talking to an educator of almost 35 years. She was about to retire. And I asked her, I said, so what do you want me to take back? What do you want me to take back to Washington? And she said, you know, Dr. Samuel, it's two things. She said, we can't continue to talk about academic loss until we talk about relationship loss. And at its core, that's what we need to talk about is the relationship loss. And I, I tell you this not only as like a talking education head, but I was a public school educator for almost 10 years. I was a teacher. I was an assistant principal principal. And I can tell you when you really get into the building level or the community level, because you talk to coaches, you talk... At its core, kids are starving for relationships and connections. But it's not just a whole society approach. Right now, the whole village is stressed. Kids are stressed. Parents are stressed. Educators are stressed. There is stress at every, every level of the village. So it's time to take that step back and, and not just try to power through things as are. We've got to get back to the basics. Um, this is, as I mentioned, this is my second year in the, this role. And last year, our theme was all around parent, family, and community partnerships because we realized you can't do it in isolation. But the feedback we heard was it's great to prioritize parent, family, and community partnerships, but we really need to focus on adult SEL and well being. Because if our adults are not okay, nobody else is gonna be okay. So we've shifted the focus this year, and I always like to bring educators into the room. I was talking to a superintendent just two weeks ago, and I asked him, I said, why are you focusing on adult and educator well being? An educator holistically, from the manager to the bus driver to the crossing guard. And he said, because if you don't feed the teachers, they'll devour the children. Mm. Not a good analogy, but a right one at last, <laughs> like for real. And so we have to put the focus and energy on adult well-being. And it is having these conversations. It is thinking about where are we channeling resources. It is about how do we build those bridges within the community from faith-based providers to out-of-school providers to, school, to in the classroom. Because the reality of it is all of those supports are needed right now. The other thing that I hear over and over again, and I'm going to say it, and we can talk later, is that people don't want politics, national politics playing out in their local communities. They don't want it. They see that their kids are not okay. They see that their parents are not okay. And this politics about book bans, CRT, all of, there's nothing more than a distraction because the data is there. And so we just need to get laser fo focus, focused and all the while we need to understand the politics. We can't be political when it comes to our young people. That's why we created hip hop. It started to solve problems. We created hip hop. Kids started going to school because they saw themselves and they saw people that they could look up to talking about don't be in a gang, don't do the drugs, don't have the sex. Your DMC in a place to be, I'll go to St. John's University. We wasn't preaching it, we was representing it. I didn't tell the kid, put the gun down, don't join the gang. They heard me say it and it was like, wow, school could be cool. We started representing the people in the communities. Take away all the labels, Democrat, Republican, liberal, and stuff. We ain't got time for that. Right. It's about the people and what needs to be done. 
Let's talk about summer and our people and that. Summer. Yeah. And, um, and Camp Felix. Camp Felix. Um, I'm sitting here, but Sheila, please stand up. This is Sheila Jaffe. And I think she embodies everything that we're doing here, all of us, NSLA, um, Big Brother, Big Sister, Cassell, Jet, Sheila. I met Sheila when I found out that I was adopted. And like you said, I felt alone. I knew for a fact I was the only person in the world going through this. And then somebody said, I know somebody just like you and showed me to Sheila. And we sat there. And the beautiful thing, this was therapy that you didn't have to pay a doctor for. We just sat there and talked about how we felt. And I think young people need to understand, you can cry, you can be angry, you can be confused, it's all cool. And after me and Sheila did that, it was Sheila who said, what all of you in here feel, what you feel, we got to do something about it. Yeah. So we came up with this idea <laughs> to build facilities in a city in every state in the nation of America to help the foster kids with the learning. And the main thing we wanted to do was mentorship because a lot of people are scared to adopt. Huge responsibility. A lot of people are scared to be a foster parent. Huge responsibility. But we found that the most powerful thing ever for these kids is just, I'm rooting for you. If you need to speak, you call me anytime. So we wanted to be, build these Felix facilities in every state in America to help these kids, which was a crazy idea. But then we had a great mentor. His name was Mr. Michael Lang. He's the guy that created Woodstock. The first one, not the second one. The first original <laughs> one, right? And he said, that's a great idea, but let's start with a small step. And we came up with an idea that every summer we're going to do this summer camp. We're going to get all the kids together, in this case, foster kids, so that they can see there's other people like them, and they're not alone. But while they're there, we're going to find out what is it, you know, because kids are always told, go to school, listen, and that, become a doctor. We get them there, let them see nature and stuff like that. Let them see that they're not alone. And then we ask them, what is it that you want to be? And you would think the majority of kids seem that it seems that they want to be rappers and athletes because that's all they see on social media. That's what they think life and the riches, famous. But we get these kids there and once they open and they feel comfortable, comfortable feeling who they are, what is it that you want to be? I want to be a photographer. Okay, here's a camera and photography lessons. What is, I want to be a dancer. Okay, here's a week of dance lessons. So we bring all these kids to Camp Felix so that we can do this. Regardless of these children's situations, foster care poverty, on the violence, no matter what the situation that the kids are, they were put here to have a purpose and a destiny. So we can't Felix because of Sheila saying we have to do something for them. We are allowing, we are having these kids fulfill their desk journalists. One, right, Sheila? One, I want to be like Oprah. So Sheila got her to get an um, um, internship at the, the news station. So 18 years ago, we created Camp Felix to provide kids with the opportunity so that in the midst of all the depression and war and politics, they still can become because it's possible for them possible for them to be the people that they were put here to be. Yeah. All of us. Yeah. That, that is the power of summer, right? Yes. Where, where this room knows this. Um, the reality that, and you know, yesterday I had the chance to hear several people, whether it was talk about the power of play or the power of... Um, the sort of what summer does, which is exposure, right? Mm -hmm. To your point of photography right. or journalism. Presence, presence. Right? This, yeah. this shared experience really around the supportive relationships among children, with adults, with counselors, the power of that. Aris, can you talk about Big Brothers Big Sisters has a significant role and presence in summer. Yeah. Um, and the power of being a safe space, a safe community, We've been talking about adults and actually those who care for our children. Can you talk a little bit about the way Big Brothers and Big Sisters is thinking about investing in the people who help us invest in our children? Yeah. 
So I, I think part of this, and I, and I want to double click on something that, that Daryl said, um, that one thing is, is really important. It's almost like looking at the work we do across the various organizations, institutions, like source code, right? <laughs> that at my, if I'm doing my job well, if I'm doing, and let me, let me actually back that up. If I'm doing my purpose well, mm -hmm. more than job, if I'm doing my purpose well, what I'm doing is I'm doing more than, oh, well, did you, did you win at Big Brothers, Big Sisters succeeding? Or am I winning at mentorship for young people succeeding? Whether it's at, that's the Big Brothers, Big Sisters, whether it's at the camp, mm -hmm. whether it's in other organizations, as it's in school, right. if we're doing it well. But we, we, when, I, when I talk about redesigning, and I'm coming back to your questions, when I'm talking about redesigning, the idea is the structure that sometimes we've been placed in, even as organ, nonprofit organizations, right, is we got to compete. <laughs> Right? And we're, we, we compete for donor money. We compete for all these various structures when the idea is, well, what if we redesign and stop looking at it as the idea that there's only so much pie? Which is, how do we think about really growing the pie? Right? Because the ultimate goal is we want young people to have much more access to the pie. Right? right? So if we think about it much more broader, it gives us a perspective to program much more effectively, to think about the collaborations, to build models that can get more investment in, to have redefinition of when we think about what happens in this space, whether it's the school relationship, et cetera. When you think about the summer, I always talk about the summer in a very unique way because I always talk about being proximate to communities, right? And here's the interesting thing about summer. It's the time of the year where a child or a young person is not in a set place right. when you talk, come into school to get that connection, that cultural connection. So how do we make sure that our source code travels with them? Not that they always have to come to a place. And by the way, I grew up in the after school program, so I know the power of it. We need that. But we also need to ensure that when young people are not in certain settings, whether it's school or after school, that these types of things are traveling with them. How do we do that? We do it through the idea of mentorship, right? Connected relationships. So what Big Brothers Big Sisters is doing as well as other organizations is saying, how do we ensure that we're going to where kids are? Technology, right? Not, not that technology and apps are replacing in-person relationships, but you can't have relationships if you're not going to the places where our kids are. So if we're not engaging, not to say, oh, social media is bad. Right. We gotta look and say, okay, why are they on social media? What are they getting from social media? How do we then address that? How do we then connect with those types of tools to be partners and support so that we're part along in that journey? The other thing that's really important as we talk about all of this is when we talk about proximate relationships, youth voice and youth empowerment. So the idea that every single thing that we look at and talk about addressing young people should have young people's fingerprints on it. Not the idea that we're talking to them, but that we're working with them and we're empowering them, right? Because ultimately, if we're going to build the right type of model and, and successful, and I'll go back to hip-hop, right? Because that's, like, you're my island, and I told you this, right? My first concert, my first concert was a Run DMC concert that my brother took me to, wow. right? So that's always stuck in my heart, right? But I will tell you, it was the place that I got voice, it was the idea of giving a young person voice, and that's what it's that's done. Me. I can do exactly. That. I can do that. And it gave you the sense of idea of what you could become. Yeah. In the same sense, that's what every single person in this room does and have the power to do even more. But it doesn't happen if their voice, they don't feel that level of authority and autonomy and independence and empowerment in terms of being part of this journey with us. That's the work that we have ahead of us. And it's not feeling like we. All of us have to come up with all the solutions. Sometimes it's just bringing the right people around the table. Yeah. And the right people around the table is young people. And bringing them around the table to empower them to help come up with solutions and actually listening and giving them the lanes to be able to act and get things done. Can I just chime in there? Because I think this is really important because now is not the time for scared leadership when it comes to being on behalf of our young people. Yes. The all out. Yep. yep. Pro kid. The all out assault that we are seeing on identity, 
agency, belonging, connectedness in the school setting, we need to name that it is intentional. Because if we take the voices away of some, it adds more power to the voices of others. Mm -hmm. And so we have to hold the line to stand up, not just for one child, but every single child, regardless of background, has yep. the right to be seen, valued, respected, and given voice. And, <laughs> sorry, this is one that I'm on hard sorry. because the adults, we're playing politics and well-being with the next generation that will be here, that we're leaving this world to. And we've, been, we've watched enough headlines and many of us just shake our heads and say, oh my gosh, this is crazy. I can't believe it's happening. Well, it is. And it is intentional and it is deliberate. And it's time for us to stop shaking our heads and saying, oh my gosh, we can't believe this is happening. To yep. recognizing we are the leaders, we, and we are the ones that need to stay Stand up and stand strong for our children so that they can have the voice, the fingerprints, the ability to pull out of them whatever they are destined to give to this world because we are shutting, we're giving ourselves, we're cutting ourselves short. For real. And um, I just want to add, he said something, um, collaboration. Um, when me and Sheila started doing this, we, we started getting invited all of these places. And then we started noticing we all working for the same thing. So collaboration and participation leads to the evolution and the solution. And let me give you two powerful examples of collaboration. Run DMC was the first non-athletic entity to receive a major sports endorsement from a sports apparel company. When I go speak to these kids, I tell these kids, I don't play no basketball and I have a sneaker deal like Jordan. And they go, wow, yo, that's true. And I tell them generationally, it's what you're saying. We could, the, the kids got to solve the problem. It's a generational problem. I said, if I could do it, I did that 40 years ago. Imagine what you could do now. And you should see their faces light up because then they start thinking about their possibilities. And the other collaboration is when you're separate, the wall will stay there. Yeah. Run DMC and Aerosmith. Hip hop's for the black kids, rock is for the white kids. When Steven Tyler took that mic stand in that video and knocked down the wall that was separating us, I've been to South Sudan, I've been to Russia and Ukraine touring, people all over the globe, all ages. When Steven Tyler did that, that didn't just happen in a, in, in a video, happened in the world. When we collaborate, everything that we've been working at at, for the last five years now becomes a one-year solution problem to the next level. So when you said, I got to hook up with Felix, we said, yeah, we got to hook up with you. Cassell, we all must work together in the, for the benefit of the children because, like you said, they're the next great leaders. They're, it's their responsibility to solve all these problems that these adults that didn't get it right messed it up for. So if we allow them to be who they are, whoever they want to be. But let's speak to them on their level. Let's use the arts. The arts succeeds where politics and religion fails. I have one quick last thing, and it's going to end with hope. This is a room full of promise commitment, collaboration. If you have one thing, you want to hope that every single person in this room walks out of the door to make a difference and a commitment to the well-being of children. One hope, right down the line. Daryl. Every day, do something for and with the children. 95% mm -hmm. of what I do is going to Elementary schools, high schools, and our middle schools, group homes, and orphanages. Every day, besides taking care of my own kids, because every child in the world is our children. So attention and intention are the two words that came to mind to me today. One, I am so glad that attention is being paid to these conversations 
now it's time for us to move from paying attention to it to what is our intention to change it. So every day as we walk out of here, think about our concentric circles of influence because influence comes in a lot of different ways. And we are leaders in our homes, in our communities, in our workplaces. And so when you walk out of here, walk in purpose and, and in intention. Love that. Absolutely. <clears throat> I'm just going to share with you the, the, my family motto that I share with my, my two girls every single day. We say this every single day before they walk out of the house. Be smart, be strong, be kind, be you. Be smart, make good decisions, right? Decisions for who we are and, and being a human being. You know, be, be strong. And the idea of being strong in character, right? The integrity that we have and letting our values lead and guide us in this world. The idea of being kind. Be kind to others, but also be kind to yourself, right? And understanding that you don't have to be too hard on yourself and having that sense of vulnerability. And then finally, be you. Be your authentic self, as you said. Like, embrace your identity. But also allow others to embrace theirs around you and give space to them. And finally, with being you, know your power. Everyone in this room has power. Never doubt the power that you have. Even when you feel lonely, even when you feel vulnerable, even when it's low in terms of self-esteem, we all feel imposter. I know I feel it. We all feel imposter syndrome at times. But know your power, that you have power in this world. You have the power to affect change because you have the power to change lives. And that's defining. <laughs> Please join me. In one of the conversations yesterday, Dr. Wilson talked about five moments. One of the moments he shared was the second day moment. And I think every time I am in community with extraordinary people like you, you give me a second day moment. And here is the second day moment. He shared that there are two, there are two Im most important days in our life. The first is the day we were born and the second is the day we experience or realize why we were born. And so thank you for giving all of us, thank you for all you do, because it feels like these are the second day moments. Thank you so much, artists, Aaliyah, DMC, and Fatima. Give them a great round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please don't go anywhere. We're about to wrap up, but we have students who are going to send us off. So we want to give our attention to the students. But before they come on, I just want a last final note. After their students come, we're going to have DMCs going to be signing books in the, the back ballroom. It's called the Chinese Ballroom. So make sure you go buy your book and go say hi to him. And I also want to make people know that we have a lot of work to do in the next year, but we have a great summer. We have time to prepare for it. We have a chance to serve millions more kids in a meaningful way. And then we will have the chance to come back and gather back at this hotel, November 11th to 13th, one week after next most important presidential election possibly in the history of this country. And we're gonna have to understand what that means for our work. So just know, we're gonna leave here arm in arm, doing great work, helping many more kids. We're gonna come back, celebrate, reflect, learn, improve, and see how we keep moving this movement forward. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to the wonderful students from Center Stage Academy. Please give them your attention.